Notre Dame's retooled offensive line has been one of the biggest stories throughout Notre Dame's offseason, and with just under two weeks to go until the season opener, we still aren't sure who is going to be in that starting five. All that and more on today's edition of Locked on Irish. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. And today is Monday, August 19th. And thank you for getting your week started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm Tyler Wojak. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer at Fox Sports. And this show is free and available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I appreciate you tuning in today. If you are watching along on YouTube, remember to give this video a like and subscribe. Or if you're listening to the podcast, please rate review and subscribe there as well. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can get $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Okay, Notre Dame wrapped up their preseason camp on Saturday with their jersey scrimmage. It was one that Marcus Freeman described as the very best one that he has seen since he's taken, uh, really not even since he's taken over as his coach, since he's been with the program. So, That is really encouraging to hear. We're going to talk a little bit about that in today's show, but the biggest story from the weekend and really the days of practice leading up to the Jersey scrimmage is that there might not be one, but two new starters on the left side of the line that I did not expect at all. Okay, so we're going to talk about that a lot today. today's show. Then in segment three, I'm going to talk about the five players who Notre Dame elected as their captains for the 2024 season. Um, I have some thoughts on that. No real big surprises there, but still, it's always good when your best players are also your best leaders. We're going to get that in segment three, though. Let's begin with the offensive line. And if you have been listening to the show every day throughout the offseason, or if you've just listened to a little bit of it in the offseason, you know that my biggest concern about this team this roster, what could prevent them from achieving their goals this season has been and still is the offensive line. They had to replace both their starting tackles after Joe Alt and Blake Fisher declared early for the NFL draft, something that I don't think any coaching staff expects to have two tackles leave after their junior season. Usually it's rare for guys to leave after their senior season just because the way that players are developed on the offensive line. Well, Notre Dame had to replace both their starters, plus they're breaking in a new starting center for the full season. Uh, Right guard, Billy Shrouth, he's going to be coming in and taking over that role as well. So then the left guard spot didn't really seem like it'd be breaking in a new player because there's Pat Coogan and Rocco Spindler battling it out. Well, there's a new face involved, and I have more questions about this unit than I did two weeks ago at the start of camp because it appears that freshman, true freshman, Anthony Knapp, beat out fifth-year senior Tosh Baker to be the starting left tackle, and redshirt freshman Sam Pendleton is going to win the starting left guard spot over Pat Coogan and Rocco Spindler, who have a combined 23 career starts to Pendleton's zero. Now, to be clear, this has not been made official yet. Marcus Freeman, Mike Denbrock, they spoke to the media after the Jersey scrimmage on Saturday, and they said they have not elected starters at this point in time. However, maybe by the time you're listening to this, that might have changed but it certainly seems like all signs point in the direction of Knapp starting a left tackle, Pendleton starting a left guard, and then the middle and right side of the line is already accounted for. We know Ashton Craig is going to be at center. We know Billy Stroud is going to be a right guard. We know that Emil Wagner is going to be the starting right tackle. So, yeah, I'm a little nervous about this. I've got some questions about it. And to be clear, this is no shade at all to Anthony Knapp or Sam Pendleton. I think both of them could end up becoming – really good players for the Irish in their careers. And they honestly might be really good now. They certainly earned this uh, opportunity in practice, and that's great for them because I don't think anyone was penciling them in to be the starters at this point in time. Credit to them. They fought their way, and it looks like they're going to earn the starting nod. Or starting nod, excuse me. Um, I think one thing that's very telling about this and sort of the coaches' reluctance uh, to maybe announce them as official starters is it doesn't really matter because – there are several reports that indicate that both Pendleton and Knapp took the majority of the first team reps in the Jersey scrimmage on Saturday. And considering how late it is in camp, like I said, it wrapped up on Saturday. And now these next two weeks are basically going to be all preparation for that Texas A&M game. Giving those guys reps with the starting unit 
together and then not having them start at this point would be a waste. Like, obviously, you want to have competition that's ongoing uh, throughout camp. I get that. But at a certain point, you have to realize, okay, these are the five we're going to go with, and we need to give as many reps as humanly possible to those five so that they get all the experience they need as individuals and as a unit before the season starts. So the fact that they're getting all the reps at this point in camp, to me, makes it seem like a done deal. And I feel like these guys are really talented. Notre Dame has a good track record with young guys, and then when they get on the field, they typically end up being really good players. But no matter how talented they are, I'm going to have my concerns about a unit that will have three guys making their first career start in one of the most hostile environments in college football, not to mention the fact that they're going up against one of the best defensive lines in the country. Right now, it looks like Knapp, Pendleton, and Emil Wagner are all going to make their first career start on the road in College Station in a ranked matchup in prime time. Whole college football world is going to be watching. No pressure, okay? The last time that Notre Dame played on the road in a big SEC game was at Georgia in 2019. That line had Liam Eikenberg, Aaron Banks, Jarrett Patterson, Tommy Kramer, and Robert Hainsey, a senior, junior, sophomore, senior, and junior. That group had six false start penalties in that game. I was there. It was extremely loud, and it was... Even more frustrating when Notre Dame could not stop committing false start penalties. Not to mention the fact that they also had to burn several of their timeouts early in the game because they just looked completely confused out there, right? That is the type of environment that Notre Dame is going to be up against when they face College Station. That was one game, that Georgia game, and that team in 2019, if you remember, they were certainly prone to false starts, but that's just an an example of how an extremely loud environment can impact a game. Notre Dame's going to be in a similar deal. At Texas A&M, and this is what Mike Denbrock, the offensive coordinator, had to say about Kyle Field. Quote, it's a hornet's nest. It's loud, chaotic. It is a very, very hard place for the visiting team to function, especially on the offensive side of the ball. End quote. So, clearly, the coaching staff is aware of how difficult of an environment this is going to be and how hard it is going to be, not just on the offensive line, but really the entire offense to try to do their job and execute the operation correctly every single down. It's not an ideal place to be for anyone, right? But this is the reality of the situation. Like, I might not like it, but I'm also not going to pretend like the sky is falling now because Notre Dame has to start a couple young guys on the offensive line. Because if they are the best five, then who am I to judge and say that they shouldn't be out, that they should let Tosh Baker start because he's been around longer? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, yes, this is maybe the best five that Notre Dame could put out there, but there are still obvious red flags and concerns that Notre Dame is going to have to deal with. It's kind of like, When you first get your license and you drive out on the road for the first time without someone in the car with you, like you've done the prep, you've driven the practice hours, you've driven with an adult next to you, you're eager and you're so ready to go. And it's such an exciting feeling, but like there's nothing that can really prepare you until you're driving and it's 630 in the morning and you're on your way to school and it's rush hour on 65 going north, you're half asleep. There's cars going by you like 85 miles an hour. You're just trying to merge over lanes. And you're like, wait a second. I thought I was prepared. Now I got the stadium pulse meter going on in my car. Like the prep doesn't really matter all that much. And there's really no way you know how you're going to handle that until you are in that moment. And look, we all learn. We all figure it out as we go, right? Like eventually we get better as drivers. And maybe the first time you step behind the wheel, you were pretty good. But odds are that was the worst you were compared to how you are now, because obviously with experience, you've gotten better. I feel like it's pretty similar in this instance with the offensive line. Like you can do the prep, you can do the practice. They look like the best five, they're ready to go. But once they're out there, you really don't know what's going to happen. And that is why I have my concerns. I still believe in this group. I actually put this out on Twitter that Notre Dame started four true offense or true freshman offensive linemen from 2000 through 2020. Now they're about to start their third in the span of four years. And it's technically the fourth If you include Charles Jagasaw's start in the Sun Bowl last year, but that was kind of an odd one because he's just filling in for Joe Alt. That wasn't the uh, the plan. But all of those true freshmen that I just mentioned, it all worked out really well for him. Joe Alt, first-round pick. Blake Fisher, second-round pick. Robert Hainsey, third-round pick. Sam Young, sixth-round pick. Uh, Ryan Harris, third-round pick. uh, Third-round pick. Steve Elmer was a beast on the offensive line. He started as a true freshman. He definitely would have been drafted. He just decided he didn't want to play football anymore. So... When guys start as true freshmen, like what we expect Anthony Knapp is going to do in this game um, once the season gets rolling here, he's probably going to be pretty good. Like He's probably going to become an NFL draft pick. And I think same with Sam Pendleton. Like You started to hear rumors about him 
last spring that he was making a great first impression when he was an early enrollee. So I feel like the ceiling is really high for these guys. It really is. And I'm sure that the coaching staff sees that as well. And that is playing a part into this equation because as Mike Dembrack and as Marcus Freeman have said over and over again, the offense is going to look different in week eight, week 13 compared to week one. But as it pertains to week one, really all you can do at this point is do everything you possibly can to get them ready and modify the offense in the operation to put these guys in the best position to succeed. Like I have no doubt the coaching staff and everyone who's around that team, like I trust them in their evaluation of these guys and who is best suited to go out there. I just don't feel great about it right now. And I'm hoping that I'll be proven wrong on August 31st. Cause if they get through that game, then they're going to have Northern Illinois. And then the offensive line can kind of, you know, rebound a little bit. It'll get a little bit easier before that Louisville game at the end of September. But like I said, one good thing is that, They've got Mike Denbrock. He knows what he's going up against. And these guys are going up against one of the best defensive lines in college football every single day in practice. So they're going to figure out ways to move the ball. They can run RPO. They've got Riley Leonard, who's mobile. So even if the defenders get in the backfield, he can move around and avoid him. He's a smart kid. I'm confident that he's going to make the right decision when he has to or when he goes out there and plays x and And I also think that Notre Dame can move the ball horizontally to sort of try to take the defensive line out of it. They can run jet sweeps. They can run screens. That way you're not giving the defensive line much of a chance to get in the backfield and disrupt the play because the ball is out immediately and you're on the side. So uh, for as much as the offensive line has dominated the discussion around this team throughout the offseason and in particular in camp, I think Notre Dame's two biggest additions, Ryland Leonard, Mike Denbrock, are going to do a great job at sort of supporting them and making sure that they are in the best chance to succeed. But man, it's going to be it's going to be a wild experience watching that unit take the field for the first time and just like, all right, like, here we go. We've been talking about it for months. Now we got to see it. How is this offensive line going to hold up? How are these young guys going to manage the environment, the situation, the circumstances, everything in front of them? It's a scary thought, but again, you got to trust the coaching staff here. I have no reason to think that these guys aren't ready to do it. Um, it's just going to be a hold on to your butts kind of game. Shout out to Scott Van Pelt for that one. And, uh, Look, I can't wait, but uh, we're all going to find out soon enough. But coming up next, we're going to take a closer look at Anthony Knapp and Sam Middleton and why I believe their situations are very different. Today's episode is brought to you by Fandle. You've heard me talk a lot about Fandle, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different to share with you today. So now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. I honestly cannot recommend this enough. I've had YouTube TV for years. It's great. It's affordable. You can watch different things at the same time. You have the opportunity to record stuff, go back to it, watch it whenever you want. And now this Sunday ticket option makes it even better. Like what's better than watching your favorite team every Sunday? The ability to tune in and watch every other game, check in on your fantasy team, see how everyone else is doing. And you can still obviously watch your favorite team get that big win on a Sunday afternoon. Football season is so close. I'm so excited. And FanDuel allows you to get in on the action like never before. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. So when I first heard that Sam Pendleton and Anthony Knapp were getting first team reps in the offensive line, first of all, I was shocked, right? Because that was certainly not something that any of us had expected up to this point. But when I thought about it a little bit more, I had two very different reactions because I think the circumstances are very different with Pendleton and Knapp. Okay, so let's start with Sam Pendleton. Nobody, and I mean nobody, predicted that Sam Pendleton was going to start this year. At least not at the start of the season, okay? Now, as I mentioned in the first segment, there were a lot of good things said about him in 2023 in the spring when he was an early enrollee. He flashed at guard so much so that they actually moved him to center to be Ashton Craig's backup, but he was having a bit of a struggle getting the snap down. It didn't really come naturally for him, so they're like, okay, we're going to move him back to guard. And when they moved him back, that meant that, hey, they didn't have a starting center. Well, Pat Coogan was the best option for that. So then he, Pat Coogan, started taking reps at center to be the backup. And it looks like once they made that move and moved Coogan over to center, Sam Pendleton got in some reps at guard and really, really impressed. He really took advantage of that opportunity, pressed the coaching staff, and he's going up against the starting defensive line for Notre Dame, which, as we know, is really, really good. On one hand, I'm like, well, that kind of sucks for Pat Coogan, right? Like he was just being a good teammate 
taking the backup roles, even though he kind of had the fast track to be the starting left guard for this team. So now he starts getting some reps at center. And then all of a sudden this guy who came in for him is just dominating in practice. Like it's unfortunate, but Hey, it is what it is. If Sam Pelton comes in and starts dominating, it doesn't really matter why he's there. It just matters that he's there at all. So, that is a good thing, right? That Sam Pendleton appears to be outplaying Pat Coogan and started every single game for the Irish last season. But it's not just Pat Coogan. There was also Rocco Spindler, who started 10 games for last season until he got hurt in the Clemson game, and he had to miss the rest of the season. Pendleton had to beat Coogan and Spindler, who had 23 career starts combined between the two of them, and Sullivan Absher, who is a player that the coaching staff has been raving about since he started on campus. There was a point where Sullivan Absher was considered to be someone who could potentially beat out Coogan and Spinner. Well, somehow, in the span of a few weeks, Pendleton has jumped all of them, right? That, to me, is extremely impressive. And I think it shows you just how good Sam Pendleton has been playing in practice because, you know, I talked about how important experience is and how being veterans out there, you feel a lot more comfortable about those guys going into a hostile environment compared to a freshman making his first career start. Well, the coaching staff recognizes that as well. So the safe option for the coaching staff would have been just, hey, start Pat Coogan. He started a bunch of games before. Start Rocco Spindler. He's been out there before. Nope. They're going to start Sam Pendleton, which means that he has been so good in practice that he has obviously outplayed both of those guys, but he's done it so much so that it's like not even a question anymore of whether or not that they should just play it safe. Because I think if it were 50-50 and he was playing just as good as Pat Coogan or if he was playing just as good as Rocco Spinner, the coaching staff would probably lean on the side of experience there, especially in the season opener. Now, I don't know if that would be the case throughout the rest of the season, but clearly it's not 50-50. Sam Pelton has beaten them out, and that is really, really impressive because, again, he didn't have that many opportunities to really get that shot. When he did, he took advantage of it, and then he beat out two guys with starting experience. So I was like, oh, wow. The fact that Sam Pendleton looks like he's in the starting lineup like, looks like he made a serious move. Now, when I heard about Anthony Knapp, I had a different reaction. And again, this might not even be fair to Anthony Knapp. It's just the way that I initially perceived it and how I'm kind of looking at it until we actually see Anthony Knapp on the field. Because at this point, the only thing we've seen from him is in practice. So I think it's pretty obvious that if Charles Jagasaw had not torn his pec in the first week of camp, Anthony Knapp would probably not be starting, right? Like, the coaching staff is very, very high on Charles Jagasaw. Um, he was a borderline five-star recruit coming out of high school. He won the job at left tackle um, last, last winter in the bowl prep. So he was, like, penciled in to be a starter. Mark Freeman had, like, no questions about him at all throughout the offseason. So he tears his pack, and then immediately after, Joe Rudolph, it was his turn to speak to the media and uh, he was adamant about the fact that Notre Dame was going to go with Tosh Baker. He's been around with fifth, for five years. He's their guy. He raved about the fact that he didn't transfer when he could have after spring when he realized that he had lost the starting right tackle job to Emil Wagner, but he didn't. He stuck around, and now he's going to be given this opportunity to have at least the best chance to be the starting left tackle for Notre Dame in the season opener. Again, that was just over a week ago, and now all of a sudden Anthony Knapp appears to have jumped him. That's pretty insane. Because you think about it, Tosh Baker essentially had a four-year head start on Anthony Knapp to be the starting left tackle at Notre Dame this season, and that evaporated in the span of five practices, maybe six. So on one hand, credit to Anthony Knapp for being a true freshman, for coming to college ready to go physically to compete right away for the starting job. Even if some things had to go his way with the Charles Jagas injury and how he went down and that presented an opportunity like, hey, he had an opportunity. He was ready to go when the time came, and it looks like he has taken full advantage of that. But there are some concerns about Anthony Knapp. He's six foot four, 291 pounds. That's pretty small. Like we had all that talk about Emil Wagner throughout the offseason about is he big enough? Can he hold down the weight to be a starting tackle at the college level? Well, he's going to be starting a right tackle, and now you're going to have another undersized tackle on, uh, on the left side. That's concerning. Tosh Baker, meanwhile, is six foot eight, 320 pounds. And even though He's been around for a long time. Just because he's been with the team doesn't make him experienced in the sense of he hasn't really played a whole lot on Saturday. So it's really not even the experience thing with Tosh Baker. It's just 
Um, the fact that he's much bigger and he's just been around for so much longer. The fact that Anthony Knapp, who's kind of like an underrated prospect coming out of high school, he's a three star, wasn't the most talked about kid in this class at all. But I do remember Tom Loy from 24 7 Sports. He actually put out a tweet recently because he had a, according to sources, article about every single commit in Notre Dame's class. It was a really interesting feature that he did there. And in one of his articles, the one about Anthony Knapp, one of his sources called Knapp the most, quote, violent, vicious offensive lineman they took in the class and that Knapp was going to be a big-time player. So hearing that from Tom Loy was certainly encouraging, but, like, look, it's a high school prospect. You're thinking, okay, best case for him, he probably plays, like, three years from now. He's going to be competing with Kirby Lambert. So we don't really know what to expect. I don't think many people at all expected him to be a day-one starter or even be on in competition to be the starter, but here we are. On one hand, when you look at Knapp, it could be, okay, was it process of elimination? Was just Baker not cutting it and Anthony Knapp is the best option left? Or did Anthony Knapp just straight, straight up beat him out? And Knapp maybe has just been better every single day. Like, I'm just speculating. I don't know because I'm not Joe Rudolph. I'm not Mike Denbrock. I'm not there every day in practice. This is just my perception when I first heard it. I'm very excited to see him when he plays uh, against Sex a m because it's like, wow even if it's process of elimination. He also beat out Kirby Lambert, who is the five-star, who's much bigger than him. You know, people are already talking about him being like a future first-round pick. Now, granted, he did, Knapp did have a head start on Lambert in the sense that he was an early enrollee, but still, this is impressive what he's doing. And I don't want to um, overshadow that by just saying, hey, you know, how did the situation pan out differently for Anthony Knapp and Sam Pendleton? Because it did. And my reaction was different. And I feel a little bit differently about the positions today, but... It doesn't really matter. They're both impressive, and I think that when they go out there, they're both going to have a great chance to play. And if things don't work out, if they start committing false starts, it doesn't really matter why they're there, right? The coach is just going to pull them, and they're going to replace them with any of these older guys who are right there ready to go coming off the bench. Um, again, it's going to be really interesting. I think it's cool that this is happening. It's exciting for like the future of the offensive line. You think about the youth movement that's going on there, but – this is a very big season for Notre Dame. They need to win now. The offensive line cannot hold them back to the point where they're now losing games because they can't seem to block anyone. Again, I don't think that's going to be the case. It's going to be an extremely tall task for these guys. The entire offensive line, not just Knapp, not just Pendleton, Craig, Shrouth, Wagner, very tough task to start the season with. But as I've said over and over, even though I have my questions, even though I have my concerns, I have faith in Rudolph, I have faith in Denbrock, and I have faith in Mark Freeman that they evaluated these guys correctly. They understand the situation far more than we on the outside do, and they are putting the best five out there that gives Notre Dame the best chance to win at Texas A&M and then throughout the regular season. Okay, coming up in segment three, Notre Dame announced five captains, four on defense, one on offense, and maybe a snub. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. All the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. I cannot recommend eBay Motors enough. Anyone I know that's dealing with car issues, I immediately say, hey, go to eBay Motors right now. They're going to hook you up. It's going to be cheaper than what you could get at your local mechanic. Great service, great product. I cannot recommend it enough. Keep your ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Okay, on Sunday night, Notre Dame announced their five captains for the 2024 season. And my biggest takeaway here is that Notre Dame's best players are its best leaders. And that is something that Marcus Freeman has said many times before, is a great place to be for a football team when your best players are the best leaders. And that appears to be the case for Notre Dame because all five of their captains are one of the best players on the entire team. So I'm actually not 100% certain about the process in which these guys were elected because I know that last year, Marcus Freeman said that they just gave the players a vote. Whoever got the most votes was elected captain. Um, Mark Freeman has not spoken to the media since this was announced. He spoke on Saturday. This was announced on Sunday. So let's go through it. So it's quarterback Riley Leonard, cornerback Benjamin Morrison, safety Xavier Watts, linebacker Jack Kaiser, and then defensive tackle Riley Mills. So I'm going to go through each one and some of my thoughts on each. Let's start off with Riley Leonard. So this is the second year in a row that Notre Dame has selected a grad transfer quarterback 
who's only been around the team for like nine months, to be a team captain. It wasn't a surprise last year when it was Sam Hartman, and it's not a surprise this year with Riley Leonard because the one thing I've been hearing constantly about Riley Leonard, and really one thing that everyone's been saying about Riley Leonard is that his leadership ability is truly incredible. He is a dogged competitor, and he has done everything he possibly can to be with his team as much as possible since he joined back in the winter. And even though he was sidelined throughout much of the winter and spring with his ankle surgery, like he still did everything he could to be out there, build camaraderie with his team. Over the summer, he invited all the receivers down to Alabama so that he could get work with them. So I think that his actions have been something that the rest of the team has really taken notice of. And also, he's a really good player, and he's the quarterback. And we have to be honest about the situation here. Notre Dame didn't have a ton of other options to be captain on the offensive side of the ball. Like, I don't think it was going to be Jeremiah Love or Jadarian Price because they're both younger, have not really proven themselves in the football field yet. A lot of uncertainty in the offensive line. If there was going to be a captain, it might have been Pat Coogan. He's been around for a long time, started every game last year. I thought Mitchell Evans, the tight end, would be a good candidate to be a captain. It looks like they weren't going to go with him. And then the receivers, a lot of other transfers. It just made sense that Riley Leonard would be the captain. I don't think this was a default thing either. I certainly think that he earned the opportunity. I mean, Jane Thomas said that he wanted his son to be like Riley Leonard. Like, that's insanely high praise. So, Good for Riley Leonard, good for this offense, that they have a leader and it's one as talented as Riley Leonard. But he is the only captain on the offensive side of the ball. And as I said before, the best players uh, in, in this case for Notre Dame, all the captains are some of the best players of the team. And it's a little bit telling that there's only one on offense and there's four on defense. But it is what it is, man. Notre Dame's defense is absolutely loaded. And their best player on defense, and arguably the best player on the entire team, one of the best players of the entire country, cornerback Benjamin Morrison. Uh, I believe he's really stepped up as a leader. He's also become a spokesperson for the university, which is really cool. I thought it was really telling that when Notre Dame announced the Goog 2.0 way back in the spring, right around the time of the spring game, it was Benjamin Morrison who was out there in a suit talking to alumni, talking to the board of trustees, talking about the importance of the facility, the university's investment into the football program, what it means for him, his teammates, and the future of Notre Dame football. Like, you don't get that role without really earning it, both on the field and off the field. When Notre Dame did their media tour, they brought Benjamin Morris. And again, he is the best player, but I think that when you put a microphone in front of him, when you're around a group of people, like he's really captivating. And I think that he has really established himself as a leader for this team. And I think that's a great place to be because I th- he's the best player. <laughs> like So when he has that kind of skill set on the field, he's making those kinds of plays. I mean, really, since the moment he stepped foot, on this team, or on, on this campus, he's been one of the best players on the team. Like his surgeons at the end of his freshman year was incredible, fresh and all American, and he has not taken his foot off the ass. So happy that he's healthy and that he seems to be fully recovered from his shoulder surgery, and now he's being rewarded as a captain. Very cool stuff. Next up, Xavier Watts, and this was not a surprise. Last year, he was a breakout player. This year, he's just one of the best players on the team, and everyone knows it going into the season. He won the Bronco Nagurski Award, which was given out to the nation's top defensive player, and I feel like At one point, we weren't sure if he was even going to come back to Notre Dame. Well, now he's back, and now he's a captain. And I think that his journey is one that not only everyone on the Notre Dame football team should respect, everyone who cares about college football should love and respect what Xavier Watts has done at Notre Dame. You consider the fact that he came in as like an underrated three-star wide receiver prospect out of Nebraska, earned his time on special teams, then they switch him over to defense, then he kind of bounced around between, like, is he going to be a rover? Is he going to be a safety? And then Notre Dame needed uh, more receiver bodies. And they put him back at receiver. And then I was like, okay, no, that's not really going to work. So let's move him over to safety. Well, he stuck with it throughout. He was very patient. He waited his turn. And, man, when he got his turn, did he take advantage of it. Now he's one of the best playmakers on the entire team. And I just think that, you know, for all the complaining – that people do about the modern state of college football. And look, I get it. I don't love how players move all the time, probably earlier than they should. The NIL, like, put all that to a side, right? You look at guys like Xavier Watts, guys who stick around, guys who don't shy away from adversity. They beat it. They handle it as well as they possibly can. And then they're rewarded for it. Like, I think that's something that we can all root for. And that's why Xavier Watts is such a fun player to root for. And I'm so excited to see what he can do for an encore after his breakout season last year was just insane. Like, led the nation in interceptions. Incredible stuff. Can't wait to see what he does this year for the Irish. And then Jack Kaiser, he's been around the Notre Dame football program since the Bush administration. Honestly, probably before that, I think he might be the only player in the history of Notre Dame to play for Lou Holtz 
Bob Davey, Tyrone Willingham, Charlie Weiss, Brian Kelly, and Marcus Freeman. So, yeah, it's good that he finally uh, earned a captain nod after all that. Now, obviously, I'm kidding, but I just thought he was a guy who could have been elected captain last year, but with J.D. Bertram being captain, I didn't know if they wanted to do two linebackers. Plus, he was in a starter, so maybe that had something to do with it. Either way, um, he is a leader for this team. He is a very veteran guy. He's been around longer than most of the coaching staff is, which is pretty funny to think about. So the fact that he's been around for so long, He's played really well. Now he's going to get the opportunity to be in every single day. Starter is probably not going to come off the field on the defense. He's going to be leading those guys. He's going to be calling out the defense when he's out there. He's got a great connection with Al Golden. And I think that the, the defense in particular really responds to him um, as a player and as a leader. So good for him, man. He had to wait a really long time to get this opportunity. And, man, I really hope he makes the absolute most of it this year in his last season playing college football after decades in the sport. Okay, Riley Mills. This was the only semi-surprise to me because I honestly thought it would just be Howard Cross. I didn't think they'd give it to both of them. I thought they'd give it to one of them. I just assumed it would be Cross. Um, I'm sure that in the voting, these are the top five. Howard Cross was sixth because he's been a really good player for a long time, really good leader. And the fact that he came back was honestly a shock to me because I thought for sure Howard Cross would go to the NFL because he's a bit undersized. He was extremely productive at the college level. And I was like, what more could he do to improve his draft stock? Well, Maybe there wasn't much he could do to improve his draft stock, but he just really wanted to stick around at Notre Dame and play college football. I love that. And I think that uh, that was going to help him become a captain. But Riley Mills is also a guy who could have left for the NFL if he decided to. And I never really remember hearing about Riley Mills as like a vocal leader, someone who's really just like getting the defensive line together and rattling the troops there. But it seems like he has really taken on that role for the defensive line and the defense uh, defensive unit as a whole this season. Because I remember hearing after like, like a couple periods in the very first practice at camp, he got the defensive line together and was like, hey, this isn't cutting it. I know it's just like the first practice, but you need to bring it every single rep. And I think that the coaching staff has taken notice of that. Team has taken notice of that as well. And now I think that is a big reason why he earned this spot as a captain. So it's unfortunate for Cross, great for Riley Mills. Either way, they're basically going to be working in tandem as captains on the defensive line. And uh, I just think being a captain at any school is an incredible honor, especially at Notre Dame. Every single one of these guys has earned it with their play on the field, everything that they do off the field. They are great representatives of this university. And again, not surprised at all that this is the group that they selected. And I'm just ready to go, man. We are so close. We're hitting all those little benchmarks, right? I was like, like, okay, end of preseason camp, captains announced. Now it's game prep. Like we're inching closer and closer to the start of the season and i cannot wait but that is going to do it for this episode thanks again for making locked on irish your first listen of the day i'm going to be right back here tomorrow morning for your second listen of the day check out locked on college football with host spencer mclaughlin also be sure to subscribe wherever it is that you're tuning in if you're watching on youtube remember subscribe if you're listening to the podcast subscribe there as well really really appreciate it really love how much this show has grown um, throughout this off season and can't wait to keep building it with you all every day throughout the season but i will see you all tomorrow have a great rest of your day